I can't believe what I just did. And I'll tell you why this week on Motoring 2004. TSN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. This is a clothes hanger used for hanging clothes, hence the name. But you know what, I bet you if we went back to a few earlier motoring programs, let's say in the mid-80s, we'd probably find a Midas tip with Bill Gardner recommending that we all have a hanger in our car emergency kit. I mean, let's face it, we have all locked ourselves out of our vehicle at one time or another. And you know, back then, the hanger was a perfect tool for releasing those stubby door locks. But my, how things have changed, and the hanger doesn't really work on today's modern vehicles. Although, you'd think that with all the alarms and bells and whistles, that nobody would ever lock themselves out of the car, right? Maybe not. In reality, what I want to do is one of these. Like that. Okay, now you can turn it off. That's, that's how fast you have to open it. It's pull and then pull. Okay? What we're doing today is one test trying is to teach our service operators how opinions. to safely and efficiently get into uh, members' cars when they lock their keys inside. Um, it's a big problem. We have just over a million members and we do almost 200,000 unlocks every year. So it's about one call in every six is an unlock for us anymore. So despite all the bells and whistles. Here's what you want to do. Is let that Solon is on the, uh, probably the leading authority in North America it. on okay. how to unlock vehicles. He here. conducts training what? seminars all across North America for okay. CA and AAA clubs and other people also. Okay, you are now certified on this vehicle, okay? <laughs> what he does obviously is teach people how to get into these vehicles quickly and with, without doing any damage to the vehicle. I've been there, I've done the research to try to save you all the time and effort of reinventing the wheel. These people are GM, CA towing uh, contractors and, Ford, and people uh, who do uh, light service Paul calls for us Rigid, um, uh, from all across southern Ontario the actually. The over the, the uh, three sessions, Ford over two Daniels days, we'll have about 240 people in, here. Um, and these are all drivers who service CA members. What the trick to this is to make sure when you put the plastic in here that you can see both edges. Pat is one of the best. I, you know, he, he is the top guy, but there's no other. That uh, If you learn from Pat, for sure you'll get into these cars control, and damage free. Now we open again so that you don't look like a fool. Hold the stuff before you open the door because everything will drop down, okay? A lot of the foreign models are, are different. They have different alarm systems and they're, they're covering their, uh, their tubes, which we can't get into a lot of times. They're, they're trying to not let you break into them more or less. Well, you know, they're trying to, but there's still people locking keys in the car, so that's going to always happen with the electric locks. I might add that our seminars are not open to the general public. Uh, and the automotive manufacturers realize that this information has to be made available, but they prefer to let the motor clubs uh, take care of that uh, aspect. It doesn't affect crime either on the uh, high side or the low side, uh, but we just don't want the information readily available to people that don't need to have the information. People that are in the business, if they don't take a, a course like this, uh, they're in trouble. They're going to cause a lot of damage and uh, it gets very costly. This is just a turn. You don't have to push forward and bind it. Now integrity must be a big thing here because you're learning a lot of things that could get you into a lot of different cars that you don't own. Oh yeah, but you got to be a thief to, to want to do that. So. <laughs> it's already unlocked. Supply and demand. Which is the chicken and which is the egg? More later on Kenzie's Corner. Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> what happened? I missed. You know, with Bob Lutz having been the car czar at GM for a number of years now, the fruits of his labour are beginning to show through. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the latest Chevy. This is the all-new Malibu Max. The new Malibu Max is based on GM's highly touted Epsilon platform. Now, this is the same chassis used by the Saab 93 and the European Opel Vectra, both of which are well known for their rigidity. The Malibu follows this lead. The platform is rock solid and so does three good things for the car. First, there are noticeably fewer rattles, squeaks and groans. Second, it does a good job of keeping road noise at bay. And third, and perhaps more importantly, it gives the suspension a fabulous place to hang its hat. You know, this Malibu Max is one of the few cars in its class to come with a factory installed remote starter and it works right off the actual key fob. You hit the lock button and then the start button and about two seconds later the engine fires to life right on cue. The irony is that the instant GM add it as an option, most jurisdictions are about to introduce anti-idling legislation. So even before you've bought this it's redundant because the bottom line says you shouldn't be starting the car while you're drinking your coffee, you should be getting into it, starting it and driving it away. That way you don't waste fuel, the car gets warm and everybody's happier for the fact. Riding on McPherson struts up front, a four-link design in back and substantial roll bars at both ends, the Max has a very refined European feel to it. Through the pylons, while it handles well for a family sedan, you will always know it is a family sedan nonetheless. Simply, body roll surfaces fairly early and the 215 60R16 tyres get noisy the instant you start to get even close to the limit. The Max's strong suit, however, well, it's the ride quality. Nothing in this class gets close. Indeed, you have to move up to the likes of a BMW 5 Series or Mercedes-Benz E-Class to find a better ride. It is astounding given the cost of the car. You know, when you slip behind the wheel of the Malibu, you quickly realize that this is unlike any GM that went before it. To begin with, it's clean and it's classy, but more surprisingly, well, all of the controls are exactly where you think they should be. It is, in other words, intuitive. You also get a couple of nice features. To begin with, tilt and telescopic steering. When combined with a power seat and power adjustable pedals, well, that means that a driver of just about any stature can find the right and proper driving position. It's also notable because there's no really big blind spots. The one thing to lament, the steering is just way too light at low speeds. Great for parking, lousy for feedback. The problem with the steering is that the electric assist is just too high below 80 kilometers an hour, which makes it difficult to keep the car on track because of the super light feel. Stopping power comes from a four-wheel disc brake system that comes with standard anti-lock brakes. Not only are the stops short and straight, the pedal has a crispness that was completely lacking in the Grand Prix tested on an earlier test drive. The anti-lock also works in reverse to provide traction control. Again, it works well as you can chirp the tyres before the system actually rains on your parade. The back half of this Malibu has been equally well designed. To begin with, you get an extra six inches in the wheelbase when compared to the Malibu sedan. That does a couple of things for you. First of all, acres of legroom. Second of all, it adds to the versatility. If you need the legroom, the seat stays here. If you need cargo capacity, you can actually move the seat forward by up to seven inches. It's also split 60-40, not only the back, but also the base. There's also a couple of other neat features glass moonroof above you, and audio controls for the rear seat riders. About the only so-so bit of engineering to be found on the Max is the powertrain. While it is plenty powerful, bringing 200 horsepower and awarding 220 pounds-feet of torque at a low 3200 RPM, it just sounds a little gruff at the top end. All of that said, it is nothing to worry about 
as this engine is based on GM's bulletproof 3.4 litre motor that has served the General's minivan so well. The only transmission available is a four-speed automatic. As usual, it's a slick shifting affair that also includes a quasi manumatic mode. I say quasi because it only works when low range is selected and so it is of limited value. You know, this Malibu Max has to be one of the best cars GM's ever produced. It's got plenty of power, it handles well, it rides supremely, and it's got plenty of versatility without looking like a hearse. Indeed, if this is the type of product we can expect from General Motors in years to come, it proves that the Giant is not only awake, it's about to start kicking some serious automotive butt. Our Midas tip of the week concerns engine mounts. Engine mounts do a number of things in your vehicle. First of all, they support the weight of the engine. Secondly, they position the engine properly in the chassis so that driveline angles are properly maintained. And thirdly, and most importantly to you, the driver, they isolate the engine from the chassis through rubber. You can see that this chunk of rubber surrounding the mount right here is what isolates the engine from the chassis. Now this mount and this one as well are both broken. These came out of a Cavalier about 10 model years old with 270,000 kilometers on it. Now when these things break what will happen is the noise vibration and harshness produced by the engine will be transmitted directly into the chassis and the passenger compartment of the vehicle is absolutely unbearable when this happens. What happens is you lose the adhesion between the rubber and the metal parts of the mount the center core of the mount moves off center and strikes out metal to, to the shell of the metal case of the mount. When that happens, terrible vibration inside the vehicle. Replacing these mounts will get your vehicle running smoothly and quietly again. And believe me, once you've experienced this problem, you'll believe it's well worth the money invested in replacing both your broken motor mounts. That's your Midas tip of the week. This vehicle on a fully loaded uh, Pathfinder Armada, you can have up to 14 cup holders. It simply extends our brand into an area that makes absolute sense. Pathfinder buyers have been leaving us because we don't sell a full size uh, SUV and now we have one. The X3 is going to bring the sports activity vehicle concept to a broader range of customers. It's going to bring new customers into the brand because it offers all the advantages that we're, in, we're familiar with of the sport utility vehicles, but with the BMW car-like driving dynamics, um, safety, comfort, and everything the customers appreciate so much. Here we're going into the price category below the X5, a more compact vehicle, more sporting in its, in its driving characteristics, perhaps a little bit more youthful in its feel. It's a good car. Um, it's very solid. It takes the corners well. The, uh, the X-Drive is um, basically idiot-proof. I made a note during the presentation that it's for, you know, X-Drive is for the idiot driver in every family. It'd be hard to get into a situation that this car could not get you out of. First the question, does the world really need another SUV even from BMW? And if you accept that it does, then this one is uh, clearly uh, engineered in typical BMW fashion. It's got a very sporty ride character, much more so than most of uh, what it's, uh, these price competitors would be. Um, acceleration performance is, is definitely in there, under 8 seconds, 0 to 100, and a uh, good strong mid-range. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sporting uh, take on a sport utility vehicle. It would be interesting to see who the market for is though, because I'm from Southern California and the bigger the better for the SUV. I mean, the H2 is everywhere. I mean, I know it's sized like a Freelander, but you don't see a lot of those in California or anywhere else in the U.S. for that matter. It's 
very flexible. They can go anywhere they want to go. They can take everything with them. It has the all-wheel drive and the X-Drive, all these advantages. But at the same time, it's a very fun-to-drive vehicle, a very sporty vehicle. So it'll, it'll reach perhaps a little bit more youthful customer than the X5 is going to reach out to. You're looking at the 2004 911 Cabriolet, and incidentally, the 911 is now celebrating its 40th birthday. We'll talk more about that on a future program, but of course, earlier, we were talking about locking yourself out of the car, and I'm wondering if Bill Gardner in the Quaker State Garage has a few stories about doing that, maybe even himself. How about it, Bill? Brad, I think we've all locked ourselves out of our own car at one time or another. I've done it a few times and uh, on customers' cars more than a few times by accident. One of the first things I do now is put that window down four or five inches before I start anything. But I'll tell you, a good piece of advice, get an extra key for your vehicle cut and hide it somewhere in your wallet. Sooner or later, it's going to come in handy, I guarantee it. Now what I want to talk about this week is, is uh, rear brake systems. We've got our long-term uh, Tundra pickup truck here and uh, it has drum brakes on the rear which is by far my preference in terms of brake systems. Disc brake on the front, drum on the rear. Now a lot of the domestic trucks have gone to four-wheel disc brakes, meaning disc brakes on the rear. Lots of razzle-dazzle, it's race car stuff, seems high-tech, but it's a maintenance headache. What happens is after a couple of Canadian winters, everything's a mess with rust, it's seized, and it really adds to your maintenance costs and maintenance headaches, seized emergency brake mechanisms, and real expensive brake jobs. I'm sure it works fine in the southern states like Arizona or Florida or whatever, where it's warm and dry all year round, but a couple of Canadian winters will have it seized up in a real mess. Now the Tundra's got drum brakes on the rear, which work really well. One of the reasons drum brakes work so well in our uh, climate conditions is the fact that the drum covers the entire brake mechanism. When that drum is slid on there, you don't see any of the brake mechanism. It's totally covered. Any crud that's slung off the front wheels, salt spray, mud, water, etc., that hits the brake drum is just flung off with centrifugal force. It never makes it inside. If you pull the, the brake drum off, you can actually see how well interlocked it is. There's a channel in the edge of the brake drum and two lips on the backing plate that intersect. So anything that wants to get by that brake drum has got to, you know, it, it's something like this. It's got to go around several 90 degree turns to get inside. And it simply can't or, or can't get inside to damage your brake mechanism. So this system works really well. Now one of the things that you do want to do is clean this pilot hole on a regular basis. Keep it clean and lubricated so that it doesn't seize on the hub. Now Toyota, to their credit, give you a couple of threaded holes in the brake drum here that you can install bolts and pull this thing off if it becomes stuck on there. But you want to be proactive. When your vehicle's fairly new, get the drums off periodically, coat them up with anti-seize compound or grease. Same thing with the, the pilot hole in the wheel so the wheel doesn't get seized on there with, with rust and corrosion. Now you can see that even with 20,000 kilometers on our Tundra, you pull the drum off and it looks like brand new inside and that's because it's all protected and it will look basically like this for a long period of time before any moisture gets in there. Also, the friction surfaces of the brake drum uh, don't rust overnight. With a disc brake system, if you look through the slots in your wheels, if it's been a really wet night, you come out in the morning, you'll see brown haze on there, they've started to rust. And I'm sure you've all felt the first couple of applications on your brakes are kind of rough and scratchy. And that's that rust being uh, scraped off the brake rotors. You don't get that problem with drum brakes, and that's one of the reasons they work so, so much better. Another good idea, uh, clean up the pilot hole in the back of the wheel as well, and lubricate that area as well so that the wheel doesn't freeze on the hub. That'll make maintenance a lot easier, and if you have to change a tire on the side of the road, much easier deal. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. In the movie Field of Dreams, the ghosts told Kevin Costner, build it and they will come. Well, that's the way the car business used to be. The car makers would build whatever they wanted. The customers were expected to come and buy it. Well, that's not true anymore. The customer gets whatever he wants. Well, the next stage on that little ladder is the customer's always right, even when he's wrong. 
And the next step on that slippery slope is pandering to the lowest common denominator, which brings me to sport utility vehicles. Now, regular viewers will know I don't think much of sport utility vehicles. They're heavy, they get lousy fuel economy, lousy ride, lousy handling, they're dangerous, they're ugly, they're, basically they're pretty stupid. But the customers can't get enough of them. Now, the car companies say they have to build them because that's where the profit is. Well, if profit's what they're after, they should go into the crack cocaine business. Now, they're going to say, that's not our business, but that's where the profits are. Now, Bradford Productions, maybe they could be making porn movies. There's more money there than in car shows, but that's not our business. We do car shows. The only company I know who has the faintest embarrassment at building an SUV was Volvo. The safety guys at the XC90 launch said, you know, yeah, this would be better if it was lower and safer and everything else, but it's the best we could do under the circumstances, because Americans want these big trucks. Which brings me to the newest SUV, BMW's X3. Now this is, as they say, very good drag coefficient for an SUV. It gets very good fuel economy for an SUV. It has good ride and handling for an SUV. It actually has more luggage space than the bigger X5, so that's at least one step in the right direction. But doesn't anybody at BMW think, geez, how much better would this be if it were 80 millimeters lower, about 200 kilograms lighter, the same amount of space and utility, well, then you'd have a three series station wagon. Now, can you blame BMW for building this thing if this is what the customers want? Maybe not. But I have a 2002 BMW, a 1973 model, moldering away in my woods. And every time I look at that car, I think, I hold this company to a higher standard. Well, I guess this is the last time I'll be in Spain on a BMW launch. I'm Jim Kenzie. Before we go, just a reminder that our one hour car of the year special is quickly approaching when we check out the class of 2004. Now we have posted all the nominees in each segment on our webpage, so why don't you cast your vote by logging on to motoringtv.com or tsn.ca. That's it for now, we'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. One of the problems in our industry is uh, uh, that it takes too long and also that the no car is never no. ready when promised. We want to make sure that uh, if we promise you this vehicle will be done in three days, we'll give it back to you in three days. Whoa. <laughs> TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that.